I read 63 books this year, here are the best of that bunch. Hello, my name is Chloe, welcome to my channel, Recovering Book Snob. This year I gave 14 books in total, five stars, and I want to talk in detail about my top 10, but I will be giving the top four a little honourable mention because how could we possibly leave them off, you know? First up, and I think possibly my favourite book of all time, The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood. This is a dystopian novel first published in 1985, set in the near future in what would have been the United States of America. It's about a Christian fundamentalist regime that first rose to power as a result of a fertility crisis. And in this world, there's a very strict class system, so poor women, or not even poor women, just women who aren't super wealthy, end up being walking, talking wombs for the super wealthy. They are known as handmaids and they literally live in the homes of the rich families. It is extremely violent and brutal and it tells the tale from the perspective of a handmaid called Offred, who reflects on her daily life as a handmaid but also reflects on a time before this all began, which actually is kind of the near past. I love so much about this book. I consider it to be as close to perfect as a book can be. The writing is incredibly powerful and it's very full of layers. The setting is so vivid um, and as I said it's also very grim. So combined with Offred, our main character's kind of normal uh, perspective or kind of average perspective and also her dry sense of humour, it just creates something pretty magical. And that humour, which is mostly like a dark observational humour only intensifies the horror. All in all, this book destroyed me and I'm so pleased that I read it. I actually have watched some of the series, not fully, because I just could not stand the gore when in front of my eyes in the series, but I listened to the audiobook and that was an incredible experience because it is narrated by Elizabeth, Elizabeth Moss, who is the person who acts in the Handmaid's Tale series and she has a questionable personal life but is an incredible, incredible actor and is just perfect for the part and I think really does Margaret Atwood's tale justice. Next up we have The Bell Jar by Sylvia Plath. This is a semi-autobiographical story set in the 1950s about a girl called Esther who's I think 19 at the time and struggling with depression and anxiety as she tries to become a writer. The book starts with Esther being awarded an internship in New York City for the summer, but when she gets to the internship, which is like her dream, she finds herself quite detached, quite numb, she's not really having a good time and she doesn't understand why, whether it be the work or even just the fun or supposedly fun social activities she's meant to be getting involved with, she just doesn't care. So it begins like that and you move locations a little bit, um, but it basically follows her mental health spiral. The opening page of this book just instantly hooked me and the writing was just as good and continued to build throughout. There wasn't really a flaw or moment where there was a lull or I had any doubts about this book being a five-star read. The writing is just brilliant, timeless, quite haunting actually. The depiction of mental health in particular and her struggles with it were very real and I think very accurate. Although obviously everyone's individual struggles are vastly different, I think the general sense of uncertainty um, is portrayed so well and just being inside the brain of the protagonist in this way um, with the writing being so beautiful and kind of flowery in a sense but then also quite concise, uh, it didn't feel waffly. I just think the quality and style of the writing is very rare. I don't come across it often at all. There are also just so many quotable lines. I think you can safely assume in this list that all of these books are incredibly quotable, but The Bell Jar in particular has some crazy, crazy quotes. Finally, the first book that I still have with me in person, and thank goodness I do, thank goodness, thank goodness I do because it's a thousand pages or just under, and I think it's important to show off when that is the case. Anna Karenina by Leo Tolstoy. First off, this book was totally different to how I expected it to be. It follows Anna, who falls in love with Count Vronsky, who is not her husband. Her husband is Karenin, and they basically have an affair, 
that completely is talk of the town. They're in the kind of upper, upper class St. Petersburg circles and total chaos ensues and to be honest it just gets worse and worse, their lives completely unravel um, and this is the journey. The reason why it surprised me, um, and I was actually a little bit disappointed by this but I get it, I understand, is that you actually end up with a lot of stories that aren't Anna. You learn a lot and in serious depth about loads of the other characters. You learn about Anna as well, but you also learn about other characters that are kind of intended to be a contrast to Anna. So I guess you're kind of learning about Anna by seeing how she is or isn't reflected in other characters. But yeah, in case you can't tell, it's a bit of a brain juice challenge. Um, I was pretty exhausted once I finished this book, but I couldn't not give it five stars because of how incredibly real all the characters were. And the story in general kind of meanders and plays out in a way that I'm really not used to. Uh, things don't necessarily get tied up in neat little bows. You're following things and expecting things to happen and then they just don't. Or you can feel a certain climax arriving and then a totally different climax arrives instead. It's really really hard to predict what's going to happen in this book and it's kind of part of the magic of it. It feels like a true story, like it's not often that I read a book and my brain can't really distinguish between real life and fiction, uh, but it happened with this. I think also in general that style of meandering and climaxes not necessarily being as satisfying or as you predicted. I think that style could be really frustrating and I definitely could lose my patience with it if not executed well, but when done well it's just so powerful and it really came together in Anna Karenina for me. Another thing that's really interesting about this book is that it's set in the 1800s and it was written at that time by Leo Tolstoy as I said and I was really encouraged and interested to see how the woman of the story were really fleshed out in a way that you come to kind of not expect from writing of that time. You felt that the women in it were just as or had just as much potential for intelligence or for foolishness as the men in it and I really liked that everyone in it just felt like people. Don't get me wrong, the women didn't have a good time in this book, but if anything, that was just realistic. There was this particular moment quite early on in the book where Karenin, this isn't a spoiler because it's what the book is all about, Karenin kind of first discovers or first starts considering the idea that his wife might be having an affair and he considers for the first time the fact that his wife has an internal world and it's it was fascinating like reading about that. It's a whole page or more even about a husband looking at his wife and realizing like, wow, you have feelings and stuff going on in your life that I am completely ignorant to. Anyway, five star read, give it a go when you have the brain juice, um, a really good time. East of Eden by John Steinbeck is another. I'm so sorry, I do actually have contemporary books on here, but there are a lot of classics. Clearly I can't completely let go of my love for classics. So East of Eden was described, I read that East of Eden was described by Steinbeck, the person who wrote it, as the first book, which I absolutely love. Imagine having that confidence. That is so arrogant, but equally having read it, I get it. It's an incredible, incredible book and it does have that epic, sprawling, feel. It is set in Salinas Valley, California. It's a generational tale, so it's told across multi-decades and it tells the story of two families called the Trasks and the Hamiltons from quite different backgrounds. And the families know each other and they kind of play off each other and the generations are described as helplessly reenacting the fall of Adam and Eve and the poisonous rivalry of Cain and Abel. Just FYI, although it's based on loads of biblical themes. You definitely don't have to be Christian to appreciate the novel. I'm not even going to try to describe the plot because it's so vast, so much stuff happens, um, but the main themes are kind of around identity 
and jealousy and love. And I have to say, the book was quite tough to get into. You have to be ready for some seriously long descriptions of landscapes, but it was so worth it and so rewarding. The characters are beautifully filled out and the insights were incredibly relevant. The stories are about people and there are lessons to be learned about people that may never change. Next up, Sula by Toni Morrison. This book was a total surprise. I hadn't heard of it at all. And then I think I looked into shorter books or I was researching shorter books and Sula came up. And again, because it's quite short, I think it's like 220 pages or something. I wasn't expecting loads. Like how much power can you really pack into a short book? And I was so wrong. I was so, so wrong. This novel was first published in 1973 and it tells the story of two young black girls, Nell and Sula, who are friends and living in a tiny, tiny community in the US. Uh, Sula goes away and gallivants around the other cities in the US while Nell stays and kind of settles down, has kids, starts a family, uh, and then Sula returns. Their friendship kind of breaks down and the whole town really is quite suspicious of Sula. I just found this book so incredibly thought-provoking, as I said, especially for a shorter book. I just can't believe like it, how much I learned from it and how much it made me feel. Uh, I wish it was longer but equally it carries the weight of a really long novel anyway, so does it need to be longer? And to me, it's so beautifully written uh, and it's a story about, it's about lots of things, but it's kind of, for me, about female friendship uh, and growing up and changing uh, and maybe drifting apart. And this is also my first Toni Morrison. Also, side note, but I love books that center around tiny gossipy communities. I read The Mothers recently by Britt Bennett and The Mothers is told through the lens or like one of the voices in the book is the gossipy like church mothers. And I just think that's a really fun angle. And Sula has that angle as well. Crime and Punishment by Dostoevsky. Crime and Punishment has a special place in my heart because it's actually mm, the first Russian literature book that I ever read. Um, and it surprised me in so many ways, um, in so many good ways. It's the story of a student who is quite isolated and quite grumpy, frankly. Um, and he randomly murders an old woman that he kind of doesn't like that much. Already, like, doesn't that, that just sounds bizarre, I know, but it is truly, like, that is how bizarre the story is. Um, and the whole point is that he does it kind of for no reason, kind of just because he can. Um, there's more to it than that, but it's a really interesting look at, like, morality. And the protagonist is also pretty unlikable, <laughs> which is my favourite type of book. I love an unlikable protagonist. He's also very chaotic and it is a it is a classic classic in that there are loads of long paragraphs and you do get the odd speech and things like that and the writing is tiny. Like, it is a little bit of a slog, uh, but similar to the others that I've mentioned, it's definitely worth the slog and I wouldn't say it's really complex to understand. It's more just like having the stamina to sort of pay attention to it. That's the biggest challenge. But once you're in there, it makes sense. Uh, and I also, the thing that surprised me most is that I found a bit of a dark humor in this book that I really didn't think would be there. The protagonist is quite sort of rude and unpredictable. And he also gets to a point where like people aren't seeing him as the criminal or people don't understand that he's the criminal and that in itself is kind of turning him a little bit insane and he cannot handle that and it's just very weird and very interestingly done and the title is so intimidating but I promise you it's not as intimidating as the title suggests. I thought it would be so chock full of philosophical lessons and that they would make it drag and it would just be a bit agonizing 
and it wasn't that. A little life. Uh, I no longer have this book physically. I had to get it out of my house because of the cursed energy it was spreading. No, I joke, a friend loaned it to me. This book is on this list. I'm sorry, I'm sorry it's on my list. I know, I complained about it loads. I've made loads of videos about it, but it had to be here because the writing is beautiful and it's one of the most compelling books that I've read this year by far. If you haven't read it and you're just going off the blurb, the blurb is misleading, let me tell you that. So it is about four classmates, or the story starts with four classmates who've just graduated and they move to New York together. The blurb sort of implies that Jude takes centre stage, this is one of the classmates, but it does not really represent how much Jude takes centre stage, like the book is about Jude. I know that it is kind of about the other classmates, but in terms of, in terms of screen time, in terms of page time, this is a book about Jude's life. Uh, the character Jude is quite intriguing, he's quite lovely seeming, very beautiful, very intelligent, everyone kind of loves him, but he has a really really grim past, really bad mental health issues. As you read the book you un start to understand why, there are sort of flashbacks, he has physical injuries that are really severe, um, so it's a really sad horrifying book uh, and that is the main criticism that people have that I share um, is this feeling that it's kind of trauma for trauma's sake but for me it's on this list because it's just masterfully written. You are made to care about each character so deeply um, even though they're very flawed uh, and there are also these really lovely changes in narrative voice that keep it really interesting and that I felt really added a lot to the story. Like there are just a lot of writing devices that are so appropriate and used so well. Um, Hanya Yanagihara is so talented. Crying in H Mart by Michelle Zorner. This is a memoir by Michelle Zorner who is the lead singer of Japanese Breakfast who to be honest I actually, I actually had heard a little bit of their music but not that much of their music. So you do not have to be a fan to read this book. This book is almost nothing about her art. Um, obviously it plays into it and it's a huge part of her life and her traje tra trajectory. But yeah, I think everyone should read this book, especially because of how small it is. You have truly no excuses. This memoir is mostly about Michelle's relationship with her mother, uh, who is dying of cancer and does eventually die of cancer. Um, her mother is Korean and is the sort of Korean side of her heritage and Michelle is not well connected with that side of herself. She barely knows how to cook any Korean food and so when her mother is diagnosed she makes it her mission to try to sort of connect a little bit more and it's this slightly frenzied kind of desperate search for connection to a side of her that she's neglected um, and so she feels very guilty for that but then it's also about just like her struggle to be in touch with that heritage um, growing up in a very white part of America. The book is just stunning, I'm so in awe of how Zorna kind of recognises her emotions and writes about them. It must have been really fresh as well when she was writing this book. So I just can't get over it. It's really, really beautiful and I do want to see what else she writes, whether it be more kind of memoir or semi-autobiographical type content or a completely other type of book. Like I wonder if she just wrote this book because she felt compelled to write it and it was like a processing thing or whether she is going to go more down the author path. Yeah, the writing is just fearless and this book will be in my heart forever and I'm just so grateful that she gave us access to such an intimate uh, part of her life. Um, thank you Michelle Zorna. It's also very a very simple read, it's a kind of funny contrast to the books I've been talking about before, like the prose is very simple, very to the point, but it's just so beautiful because of how 
like real it is and you just feel that she's catching her feelings and putting them straight on paper and there's very little filtering of them um, or just kind of editing to make them more attractive or more marketable. Fleabag the scriptures. Fleabag is a TV show, if you're not aware, written by Phoebe Waller-Bridge, and The Scriptures is the screenplay of that show. It's the story of a 30, early 30s woman whose best friend has just died. Her mother has also died, uh, not as recently, but recently enough. She has a pretty emotionally disconnected father and a very uptight sister and a completely hopeless love life. She's incredibly self-destructive and things are just going really badly and she's definitely not helping. The story's funny, but it's also incredibly sad. If you've watched any Phoebe Waller-Bridge interviews, she talks quite a lot about using humor to disarm the audience. You kind of reel people into this false sense of security and then you just reel back and punch them in the gut. I've seen Fleabag multiple times now and I've read this and with each watch and revisit, the story changes, the meanings are a little bit different. When I first watched it, it was more a comedy and when I next watched it, it became a lot more about grief and although it feels like the story is about her love life, it's more about her relationships with her family. It's definitely specifically her sister. Um, so that's really interesting and I think really speaks to how layered this is. Young Mungo by Douglas Stewart is the final of my 10 favourite books of 2023. This I picked up fairly randomly. I think it was just at the library, which is my favourite way to pick up books that I end up loving. It's so satisfying. Young Mungo is Douglas Stewart's second book. I've actually recently read Shuggy Bane, which was his first novel, but Young Mungo is the one that I hold most dearest and most close to my heart. It is the story of a young gay Glaswegian boy and his experience exploring his sexuality, falling in love for the first time, also just his wider home life, he has a pretty aggressive, dysfunctional mother and brother. He has a sister who kind of slightly abandons them to save herself, or at least that's how it feels like she's going. It's extremely emotive, very difficult to put down, uh, just an extraordinary story. It's very sad, but it does have this kind of shred of hope that keeps you going. Um, I'm not saying it's not a really sad book, be ready for an incredibly sad book if you read this book, but it's also just really beautiful. It's also told through a kind of two timeline. So you have the present day where young Mungo is on a fishing trip with some slightly strange seeming older men and you don't even really understand how he got there. And then you have the past, which I guess is explaining how he ended up on this trip. And yeah, I thought that two timeline point of view telling um, added a really nice little thing and was executed really well. Why did I say that? Really nice little thing. It was good. It was well done. I liked it, okay? Okay, we're at the end. I've done my top 10. Um, I'll tell you about my other four then, just because you asked. But let me quick fire them. The Idiot by Elif Bautman. This book is meandering and nostalgic about a woman at college who kind of falls in love, but it's a bit of a puppy love and she's a bit of a fool and she's a little bit pretentious, but we love her. And does anything really happen in this book? Maybe, but also maybe not. Next up, Prima Facie by Susie Miller. This was performed by Jodie Comer in London. I believe she's in New York performing it now. This one is a play. It is so punchy and made me feel so many feelings. It's about a young female barrister who's excellent at defending alleged rapists and people accused of sexual assault. And she's really good at kind of devaluing the um, victim's stories until one day she experiences sexual assault and it kind of flips and she unravels and she starts questioning 
everything she knows about the law and the legal system. Educated by Tara Westover. This is a memoir that tells the tale of Tara's life growing up in a kind of Mormon fundamentalist family and it's her escaping that family and getting an education. It's just a crazy, crazy tale and again one of those things where I just cannot believe someone is able to write a memoir and just do it with so much honesty and so much detail. And finally Americana by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie about a woman who is Nigerian and then moves to the US and then returns to Nigeria and it's kind of about her developing her sense of identity, um, also falling in love and the different loves she has um, and then also a bit of a compare and contrast of like her experience as a black person in Nigeria versus the States. Just a really really moving story, entertaining, easy to read. 500 pages did not feel like 500 pages, I'll tell you that for free. Okay, all of my five star reads. I can't believe how much I have read this year. I think in 2022 I read 10 books, so 63 is ridiculous. And also I actually only read one book in January, so it's been a busy 11 months or 10 months. Thank you for everyone who's been watching my channel. This obviously only started this year um, and it's definitely, definitely a part of why I've been so good with my reading habit. Happy New Year, wishing you a wonderful start to 2024. I hope all of the demons of 2023 melt away and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.